Okay, so let's revisit communication in Bro. In 2005, Robin created the independent state framework. And since then, Bro was able to communicate with other bros. And Christian Kreibig, he wrote the Broccoli Library, which is an acronym for Bros Client Communication Library. And that allowed arbitrary C applications to interface with Bro and send data in Bro's data model to Bro instances. And that allowed essentially to incorporate host-based context or any sort of external context into Bro. Then in 2007, we had the Bro cluster. And that started really as a way to parallelize Bro computing because a single machine couldn't keep up. Remember, Bro has been designed in the 90s. There was not even threads were there. That was just a single OS level process and it was a single thread was crunching through. That obviously didn't scale. The data is exponentially increasing. So that's our current model today that we have the Bro cluster as a way to distribute the processing. If, there's not in, if, if Bro can't keep up, you can simply add a node and um, the processing scales linearly. Uh, we also have Python bindings, uh, Ruby and Perl bindings, and all of that is under the umbrella of independent state. That's the, um, and so, but now we're moving on, moving forward, and um, we currently have our prototype of broker available, which is set to replace all of the uh, past communication. And our goal is to ship one zero hopefully sooner than later. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Broker actually is, about the API, the performance, and how to move forward. Broker is uh, essentially Bro's data model plus publish, subscribe, and distribute key value store for persistence. And I'm going to illustrate the publish, subscribe communication with uh, example that does not yet exist, but may be implemented. So consider you have a, a bro cluster running on your network, and what you want to do is spare phishing detection, and you want to deploy it in real time. Say so you have a model that's on the top left that is essentially a classifier that tells you, yeah, this mail might be a, a spare phish or not. And the way you, you structure it is that whenever that model changes, you publish it to a subscriber, and uh, the model gets distributed to the worker node so that they can react on it. If they see something in network traffic, say an attachment, they would publish that to the subscribers, say the downstream analysis nodes that uh, are written in C++, and they crunch on the files, read them, deconstruct them, uh, run them maybe in a sandbox, and um, come up with a guess of whether that is a malicious thing or not. And um, they publish their result, and that one feeds back into the model. So you could structure this whole application in a publish-subscribe way, and that's uh, one way of doing it. And the second component to a broker are the key value stores. At some point, you will notice that uh, your worker nodes fail, uh, you have, or crashes are just the norm, and at that point, you wish sometimes, oh, I wish I had that state still available because uh, what it accumulated over time was actually quite valuable. And, um, oh, or if you go back to the previous um, model, um, that very model that's being pushed to the workers, maybe you'd like that to be persistent and available across restarts. Um, then uh, with the key value stores that we have is you can store all the data in broker's data model in, uh, in that fashion where you have a master and a clone. The clone is essentially a cache and can um, it just replicates the master. But you can also use it to insert data. It will just always go first to the master and then propagate down back to the clones. And this is the data model that's very similar to Bro. The only difference, there's no records there because there's no real typing, it's only data. But from the Bro user perspective, you will still be able to use the entire Bro data model. So for example, you will be able to store a record inside a certain 
T. And how it currently, or let's, um, so what we've learned, we had this version, it's currently 0 0.4, we have it already out there and we have gained some experience with it and it just works fine. We've, uh, it's John Suick who did this, he, uh, we didn't have much use cases when we designed it and for that uh, kind of a from scratch design, uh, the API that we came up with just worked remarkably well. But we also found some uh, issues that we wanted to improve, um, especially there's no native type support, which I'll show you in a bit what it means. And um, we could not really have a way of blocking and non-blocking processing in the same way. So the current API is, that's the C++ version, is you start by initializing the library, creating your own endpoint. That's essentially one node. That's one of the uh, blue circles that I've shown earlier. And you can uh, connect to another node by peering with that other node. And uh, that's just a TCP connection. And the comment is a bit misleading here. Uh, that's just that's a weird artifact that should not, this next line here should not show up in the public API, but essentially is what you're doing is you're blocking until there is a change in the outgoing connection status. So that's a kind of a weird way of expressing that. Um, and then what you do, uh, you may send a message to that um, topic. It's all topic-based, publish, subscribe. On the topic's bro slash event um, but that you send there, maybe to bro itself, uh, bro will look at the first argument of the message. It's the event name and then take the remaining values as arguments to an event. So you could directly send that data to a bro event handler that way. That's the current API. And yeah, if you don't, you also need to block again at the end of mm, that. So we, we try to simplify this a little. It's the weird blocking constructs are in there. Um, another, and we also capsulated all global state in um, this context object. And now you just spawn your endpoint and you describe which API you want, either the blocking API or the non-blocking. And then I'll explain it in a little bit what the difference is here. But in the past, in the previous, in the, or the current version, you can only have one broker instance in your entire process. If you wanted to have, if you link multiple plugins together so they all use broker, uh, it would be very difficult to coordinate there. But now you just create your local context and uh, it's safe. So now what you do is you create a vector of data and uh, publish that to the endpoint. That's, and that's, that's it. There's essentially, there's no overhead in the API. It's not, not a big difference. And I think it becomes more apparent when we go to the flexibility of the API. This is the blocking version. So when you spawn your endpoint, you can subscribe to topics and then you block and receive. That's the, that's the function receive. That blocks until a message comes. And then you can look at inspect the topic and the data. And uh, you can do the same thing in a more functional way where you pass a Lambda function to receive and it will do the exact same thing except it will already pre-separate the topic and the data. The non-blocking API uh, looks a bit different. First of all, when you spawn your endpoint, you have to tell that you want to use the non-blocking API. And uh, what you do now is uh, you subscribe to a topic with a callback. And that gets called by the runtime without blocking. So the goal here is really to move any sort of blocking away from your application because that's essentially a lost CPU time. And um, these, yeah, these are two examples of how to subscribe to a topic. And the data store API, here we have a master with two clones that run on uh, three different endpoints is uh, structured in a similar way. We have a context, we spawn our endpoints, peer, essentially create the black links between the endpoints, and now we're ready to attach our, end, our stores. So one store would be the master, and the other two would be two clones. And they all have a certain name, um, and that one is just, um, 
that automatically attaches a if you attach a clone, it has and it needs to have the name of the master somewhere existent among the peers. And um, there exists different backends. This one takes the memory backend. Uh, this is just an in-memory hash table at the master. There's also SQLite and RocksDB as backend for persistence. Yeah. And if you want to write into the master directly, you just do a put with this key and a value, and it can be any type from both uh, from that data model that we have. It can be a string, an integer. Um, that's the way it works. So here, for this code example, uh, what would happen is when you when you put a value in the master, it will transparently get propagated to the clones in the background. It takes some time until the value arrives there. So that's why there's a little sleep here for the propagation delay. And then eventually you can access the value at the clones too. And to query it via the clones, what you would do is in the blocking way by specifying explicitly blocking parameter in the API, but that's, you can be omit, that can be omitted. That's the default case. And uh, in the non-blocking ways, it's pretty much the same way that we saw before. You just uh, specify the data that you got back. Or in case an error some, um, happened, you can also specify an error. So uh, we wrote the current version from scratch and um, did a little benchmark to see if it actually was a good idea. And we just had two end, we have two endpoints here, sender and a receiver. And um, when send the data, in the look at the throughput in terms of messages per second, we see roughly a 40% increase in, in the messaging throughput. So right now we have around 60,000 messages per second for a bro con log. That's put a con log entry, that was the unit of a message that we use for this benchmark. And so that's, yeah? Are those labels right? No, the labels are, should be flipped. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the answer, so. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> well spotted. <laughs> um, and uh, the interesting part is, yeah? Yes. So uh, this is, so one, this, there's less blocking. There's simply more time now to do processing. But uh, in this benchmark, um, I would imagine, I haven't dug into the code to see why is it so much faster because there's a few indirections also removed as part of the rewriting. So for example, messages are not get bounced as much around. They kind of go straighter to their destination. And I would imagine that this is one of the um, effects here that there's one less indirection, but but also the fact that there's less blocking involved. We're still looking at the multi-node performance, and that's yeah. I would imagine it scales linear, but we don't know that um, where the bottlenecks are in this regard yet. Um, so for that broker to be released and uh, shipped with the uh, next 2.6 is the goal for broker to get enabled in, in, in Bro right now. We shied away from, <laughs> from releasing it with 2.5, which was our original goal, but then uh, we really wanted to take the time to edge out all uh, come up, uh, yeah, finish those corner cases and the uh, make sure that the performance is more robust and have a very sane API that where users can shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, we also have uh, new Python bindings. And if anybody has worked with the old Python bindings, there was a lot of wrapping necessary to convert between Python native types into broker types. And in the new API, it looks pretty much the same with the C++ version I showed earlier. Uh, you can directly send, say, a a list of values and they will transparently map to the broker um, to the broker data types. Uh, the bro 
component is not yet there, but that's a very straightforward implementation. An interesting part about how the bro scripts will look like. So right now, um, there's a bro data is not, does not correspond to a specific bro type. When you write a value in, into the data store and want to do a lookup, um, then you need some way of, of getting that actual type because data can be either a string, an address, a port, or something. And um, it, the current code looks pretty cumbersome to express that. So what, what we want to do is we want to overload the switch, the, the switch statement to support type-based dispatching. That's this form of pattern matching that you have in functional languages. But essentially what it means is that that local variable that comes back here from the lookup, that is going to be a data of type data. And when you do a switch on it, you can actually look inside and see what type of data is it exactly. Is it an address? Is it a string? And then um, execute the corresponding code. That's something we, uh, so we're going to, or planning on changing the language to support that with, uh, with the next release as well. And then there's going to be flow control, which I'm going to elaborate a little bit on more on. Now, when in the message passing system, um, when one node gets overloaded um, and cannot, it cannot accept any more work, it will just queue up its, its messages. And what's a common fix for that is, well, we're just going to create, add a new node beforehand. Say we put a Kafka in front of it, and maybe it's the problem solved. It's, it's just redirecting the problem. You, all of a sudden, we, we still see the overflows, but just at a different level, just one level higher. And then we, we just shifted the problem by one indirection. And we also introduced now a new failure component and in, in that middle node. And what's problematic, that could be also a hitter, there could be a different messaging API underneath and they cannot communicate. They cannot communicate their status about the queues up to the sender. And what the solution would be is that if, when a node overflows, it, that it communicates back to its sender, and not just to its intermediate, to its direct sender, but to the very source, that it cannot handle the load anymore. And the idea is to reject the work at the boundary already before it enters the system. So what does that mean concretely for Bro? In the context of Bro, we have multiple sources of data flow. We have packets, we have events that's being, that are being exchanged between workers and master, and then the workers send their logs to, uh, say, a dedicated log node, and that node writes its logs out to the file. And all of these streams are poten can potentially clog up and what we're, what we're trying to get is to a unified messaging layer that can um, detect overload at each of these individual streams and coordinate accordingly. So what you would want as a user is, in, say, an overload event. or an un, And in Bro, you can handle it and all of a sudden say, yeah, you know, I noticed that there's not much capacity left. Maybe I should forego the expensive analysis. Say so all of a sudden, that DNS log that keeps up filling so quickly, maybe I'm just not, no longer interested in it, or I'm shunting other sorts of analysis that is expensive. And when the underload event fires after you've made more room, then you can maybe resume. So we used to have something like that, it was called load levels. It's not been heavily used, but that's the goal kind of to get to, a, to bring the user um, more in control and in, with the uh, with the load instead of letting it letting stuff dr drop on the floor, and uh, the building block that we use for that is the that underlying broker is uh, the C plus plus actor framework. That's just an implementation of the actor model. All these that's the messaging passing system that uh, takes care of shipping messages from A to B, and if they're same endpoints on the same process, sending a message translates to just passing a pointer. And, but if uh, message passing means trans, 
transmitting data from one process over the network to another or on a different machine even, then serialization takes place. So it chooses whatever, based on whatever the use case is, the most efficient um, way of sending data. Um, that went faster than expected. So that was, there was not much else. Um, if you have questions about broker, how to use it, um, let me know. So right now we're assuming, the question is, are there security mechanisms in place? And if there's a, an endpoint in there that shouldn't be in there, that uh, all of a sudden peers with other endpoints and maybe create some bad issues. Uh, no, this is not, we're assuming that you control the endpoints that you can connect to. So you'd, um, at least in the first version, we want it to be very simple and not have um, authorization or access control in there. Um, if, if, if it's really requested by the users that we, that we want to enforce that, it would create overhead. That's the, and it's, it's not, we had that in place already and say the current version penalizes the common case where there's no authentication taking place. So for every message you check whether, there's, uh, with that, whether the source is allowed to send that. And um, yeah, so we really wanted to have bare bones in the beginning and then see based on how users gonna use it, where to go with uh, more complicated features like that. Okay, the question is what's a, that publish subscribe built on top of, and that's a actor model implementation, that's CAF. And um, we have very close contact to these maintainers. That's the only dependency. So other than that, you only need a C++ compiler. And um, so the actor model comes from Erlang. Erlang's from the 80s, and uh, they, they developed this model in the telco context. And uh, it's, it's the, this is, the idea is that each actor runs independently. They only communicate with message passing. Um, there's no shared state between the actors, so you have no data races by design. Um, but all of these actors can execute concurrently. And they can also either be deployed in the same process or across multiple machines. So you can create very flexible topologies and in case they're all deployed in the same process, there's a runtime scheduler that maps those executions to hard threads. If you own, technically, you only want to have as many threads as cores running on, on your process to avoid oversubscription. Yeah, yeah, we use the CAF serialization framework, which is, uh, it's a binary protocol. But it's very low overhead, just one or two percent. So that's essentially the same as, as if you would um, compile Bro yourself. You also need a C++ compiler for that, but there's, there will be packages eventually. So in the same way, the RPM packages are available for the distributions. The, the broker library, it will be a shared library that Bro links against. And Bro itself also uses that to that it communicates in the same way when you uh, have the Python module that's also a shared object and with some extra scaffolding on top, that would also use um, the, the same C++ code. But from a user perspective, once Broker is built, you don't have to um, compile your code unless you want to write C++ code. So if you want to write Python code, all you do is you take the prepackaged Python module pip install Broker and then you write your Python script. So it depends on what language you want to target with your broker module. Or if you, there will be also bro script as bro language framework for that. And that's just bro script. So the idea is to cross platforms here and break up the very currently monolithic communication framework that's hardwired into bro and make bro the state and more usable to other applications. Yeah. So for, yeah, for 2.5, there's not gonna be anything to be worried about because broker will not ship with 2.5, but for, and that will be enabled by default. But in, and uh, for 2.6, uh, that's our current target. 
for the release. Um, you will need a C++ 11 compliant compiler. And that's pretty much it. That's all you need to build CAF and broker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the plan is also to have the language just be ready from the bro side so that it's really easy to work with the data stores, for example. And for that, we need to have the, the pattern matching in place. Think it. How about this? Yeah. So broker will still be in the same state for 2.5 as it was for 2.4, which means it's there, it works, it provides all the functionality which Matthias was talking about. However, the API is not very nice yet. Um, so and that's what Matthias is working on, making the API nicer. And then for 2.6, we will enable it and we will port in particular the cluster framework inside Bro over to using broker instead of the old communication framework. So it's mainly the switch. Um, of what Bro itself uses for implementing the cluster, which we postponed from 2.5 to 2.6. Yes. Yes. Um, we, uh, so the question is, can we send a message in, in JSON in the Python API? And um, let me go to the Python API real quick. Here we go. So right now, what we support is the uh, Python's native types for all these types. And um, if we wanted to support JSON, uh, the first step would probably be just to write a conversion function from JSON um, to uh, these types, and it's not always clear what you would want because JSON has no notion of ports, subnets, or IP addresses. So either you'd have your custom format, and then let's say splitting it up into an object, a single value in an object with the type and the data. And uh, then, but that's, we cannot make a generic assumption on that. So um, it would probably require some sort of wrapping on your end so that you have whatever representation you have. Another way, instead of uh, having that object split, you could also inspect the string. Look, if it's parsable as an address, then make it an address and so on. But then you may get, in some cases, not what you want. And so there's many ways, essentially, to go there. That's why we can't make a, make a general assumption. And using JSON mm, as the base protocol is a bit too verbose because that's, that's the native Python that we want to stick with initially. And maybe it turns out that everybody wants it to use in a certain way, and then we'll support that as well. Yeah. So that was just a bare bones broker uh, communication. When we had a, there's a, that was a synthetic benchmark in the sense we only created a broker endpoint uh, a receiver that published a con log, a single entry of a con log over and over, over as fast as possible to a receiver. And so there's nothing else going on. In, in Bro, when you send events, log events from manager to the workers, there's, there's a lot more going on. But um, so what we see here is like that's kind of the best case bare bones throughput. That's right now not even using any sort of batching. So um, with the flow control in place, there will be a way to have transparent batching. And uh, this is, the flow control will be uh, credit-based in the sense that the receiver announces how much capacity it has, announces that upstream, and then the sender can say, say you have 200 credits that the receiver announces. Then and if the sender has queued up 200 messages, they could just send that in a block in one shot to the receiver. And once the receiver has processed its messages downstream, it will check them and give the credits back to the sender. So this sort of advantages are not, um, they're not even yet there, but they will, we'll integrate these sort of flow control changes into CAF. They will transparently benefit broker. 
And um, in that sense, we, we're uh, assuming, because we're assuming whenever there's delay on the nodes, when they accumulate messages to be sent, because the way it works in Bro is this, there's a main loop, and at some point, Bro processes timers, other things, scripts, execution, and so on. Eventually, it will divert control flow to, to broker to say, all right, now broker, you can, you can do your processing. And um, there will automatically be a large batch, and there will be a big benefit from batching this um, data and sending not many small messages over and over, but one large chunk. And that's going to be very interesting. I think that's also an issue that current, uh, it's a big, that's a bottleneck of current deployments. One more thing. So regarding cluster performance, there was indeed part of the reason for, for postponing the switch um, of the cluster framework from old communication to broker, that um, while we have, func we, we have the cluster framework essentially ported over to broker, but for the release for 2.5, we didn't have the time anymore to ensure that the performance is there. So basically, the, the experience about how performance looks like with the new cluster framework based on broker, um, that's something we can't tell yet. And obviously, we want to ensure that the performance is good. Um, no, but I imagine that we will do this merge of this 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 port into Git Master very soon after we have released 2.5, and from that point on, you can you can you can start testing it. Yeah. No, that's not. That's actually current work right now. It will, it will help with uh, the worker nodes unbalanced. Um, it's more a way of um, ensuring overflow will not occur. So they say there's a straggler, a worker that's slow, and that cannot keep up uh, for some other reason. Maybe you forgot a cron job or so that's running and cross-firing. And, and if that one is just slow, it will communicate that upstream. And so what will be available is a new signaling mechanism for overload. And what to do in this case is uh, we don't know yet. We have to <laughs> figure out a way with what's best in this case. And maybe it's something that users want to react differently. Some, some users want to say, let's drop, let's drop it to make sure that that worker is being able to, co to continue working. But maybe uh, what you want to do is instead pass it on forward and, and uh, say, OK, the high water mark is reached now. And um, I can maybe handle 20 more percent of it. And then, then I'm definitely keeling over. So, um, maybe that gives you a small opportunity to kind of shut off some scripts. And maybe I talked about this load level script earlier or this underload and overload. Uh, what we need is also a dynamic way to reconfigure bro, to bros uh, scripts that are running. Some of them are more expensive. Some of them are quite cheap. And if you could disable, in cases of overload, the expensive ones to make sure you always get the con log, because if you don't have the con log, you don't know that it, con log or didn't happen. I think Vlad had a shirt of that. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, you want to kind of have some triaging between the different code that you run inside Bro. And that's, um, I think, going to be crucial to have uh, a more high fidelity output from Bro. There's another question. It's, it's Spinning up nodes is currently something the user has to do manually. They have to add one um, in, in CAF, and that's something uh, that's already there. You can technically migrate uh, state from one worker to another. So, Bro is not yet there, but at some point, we, what, what could work is that you have, say, one or two spare nodes in your cluster that you, that you use when that, that you're only using when there's an overload situation, and then you can migrate a hot worker to one of those work, or separate, say, some of the scripts, the expensive HTTP processing, you separate out to a different one. So, but we're not there yet, but that will be a very interesting way of uh, reacting to, to overload, simply migrating that component away from the hotspot. But with that broker framework, we uh, have set late the foundation for these sort of more advanced load balancing scenarios.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could maybe change that to usually hash-based packet assignment, and whenever that uh, bucket of the hot node comes out, you say plus one or give it to another node that the packets are being saved from that node. Yeah, that that's an interesting way of, of feeding back the information from flow control into the packet distribution. That's uh, definitely all these advanced features we hope kind of to start thinking about. This is just right now as we as we speak, these ideas are coming up, but uh, I think uh, as these clusters go larger and larger and failures are becoming more and more the norm, um, we need a more efficient way of dealing with failure other than just, oh, I guess my note has been down for a week or something. <laughs> Yeah, there's many ways to think about a hierarchical processing. And uh, in that sense, uh, the, the fact that we can combine these entities and they're linked together makes it possible to, uh, in, a, in a robust way, to propagate these errors upstream. The nice thing with relying on a single platform is that we uh, have no boundaries in the messaging layer. If you look at uh, some of these open SOC or mashups of 10 different types of technologies and they all use a different messaging layer, they cannot communicate with each other. They cannot report this sort of uh, back, they cannot employ back pressure, which is the concrete mechanism here to report overflow. They can, up, they can only do that up to the next component and, and, and then maybe they need to interface then and create different sorts of custom solutions that only work for one hop and then you mash them up together and they don't work anymore. It's It's very complicated in a heterogeneous ecosystem. And that's why also we in Broad try to not put too much emphasis on, on um, the, the integration with uh, various types of messaging layers. And in that sense, that our, the fact that we have our own messaging layer now gives us the, the, contr the full control to, to deploy something more global, more robust, and uh, something that we that we know what it's doing that we can debug. Mm, I, I see where you're going. So right now, this is really a, a star topology that we have from master to clones. And um, you're asking, well, if what if the master fails? Am I hosed at the moment? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. But there's so the common way to replicate these sort of uh, states at the masters would be to use something like the zookeeper, and that's internally using Paxos or Raft. There's some sort of distributed consensus algorithm that can be used so that the majority, if the majority of, of masters is alive, then you can always get a response. And if one fails, then you, you have to make sure that you elect a leader, and that leader is then um, the one that's doing essentially most of the work. So it's, think about this as a simplification of that model where there's always a fixed leader, and uh, the clones currently, there's, there's only one way. I think we have at this point too little experience with where the bottlenecks in this system are and how these systems fail. If adding now a distributed consensus module on top of that, that's, that's, that's very interesting, but it's, it's, it's gonna be a bit down the line. Now for two six. <laughs> All right, let's uh, keep it with that. Thank you.